In this video, I want to continue talking a little bit more about financial markets, but again, get into some more detail of, of exactly what are financial markets and, and, and how they might act. So the first thing, what, why are financial markets so important? The primary importance is it helps facilitate the flow of capital. If you remember, we talked about direct transfers where you would have to go out and find individual people to provide you with funding for your company rather than go to a financial market and have an institution go out and find all of those people. So again, we want to be able to make the exchange of capital as easy as possible and financial markets help us with that. But in addition, it helps us to promote economic growth, right? The, the more we're able to do this, right, the easier we make this, the easier growth can be. And of course, economies that have well-developed markets are going to perform better than poorly functioning markets. But I think another aspect of this uh, idea of, of why financial markets are so important this is how we create prices. Uh, we've talked in previous videos about the supply and demand of stocks, right? Without a financial market, that mechanism doesn't exist. So we need to have a way to help us create prices that are fair prices. And we'll talk about this uh, a little bit later in, in this video. So what kinds of institutions are there? Banks, there's investment banks, commercial banks, uh, all kinds of pension funds, mutual funds, exchange traded funds, right? I mean, most of uh, these kinds of things are very similar. Uh, pension funds, I mean, this just refers to a business that is involved with retirement. So they invest the retirees' money right? Private equity funds. Th these are businesses that provide uh, cash to uh, companies, uh, typically uh, emerging kinds of companies. So there are lots of different institutions involved in this transactions or these transactions. So here we have Apple wants to issue some additional stock. They're going to use somebody called an investment banker. So uh, they want to purchase, uh, an investor wants to buy some of these new shares. Is this a primary transaction or a secondary? Well, since these new shares are, are being issued by the corporation, this is what's referred to as a primary market transaction. If instead an investor wants to buy some existing shares, this is a secondary Transact, secondary market transaction. Again, we've, we've talked about this a little bit earlier. We've mentioned the concept of an IPO, right? This is the initial public offering. Shares are being issued to the public for the very first time. There are several reasons why this might happen. One of which is to raise more capital, right? Get more money into the company for growth or expansion. It also can be used to kind of uh, give the founding uh, uh, in, uh, owners, right, the people that started the company, to give them a little bit of a payoff, right? So public companies, right, they're going to have more requirements, right? If you're going to uh, uh, issue shares to the public, you're going to have to provide more information. So let's think about markets in general. How have they performed? Well, here's the S&P 500 index. And I would like to look at a couple things. Obviously, if you look, the blue uh, lines here, these are all positive returns. These are total dividend yield and capital gains. And of course, the white ones here, these are losses. So let's think about Again, this has really not much to do with finance or managerial finance, but I like to take the number negative 10. 
go across here, negative 10. How many years, how many years since 1968, right? So 68 to 2019, we have roughly 50 years here. How many years had double digit losses? We have one, two, three, four, five. Five out of 50 years have had double digit losses, right? Again, there's others, but if you think about it, even then, one, two, three, four, five, six, eight, nine, ten. There's only 11 years out of the 50 that had negative returns, and some of them were very, very low. On the other hand, how many years had more than 10% positive? Again, the number is extreme, right? There's a lot of years. So generally, when you include dividends and capital gains, generally you're almost always going to get some kind of a positive return and frequently you're going to get double digit. So when people are talking about the market is a gamble, when you look at the actual data, right, the people are saying that were in possibly at the wrong time, but they also got out and missed the benefits of being in for the long term. So again, we'll talk about this a lot in some of our other videos about how you invest and why you invest. If we think about exchanges, there are two kinds of exchanges. There's Wall Street, that's the New York Stock Exchange. And then there's also a market called the Options Exchange or the Chicago Board of Options Exchange. So what I would suggest is uh, click on these if you can, right? Click on these little links they should give you the click and follow that return. If you can't click on this link, if you go to YouTube and you um, type in this title, you will get this particular video. But Wall Street, this tells us about the New York Stock Exchange and how it works. And the other one talks about the board of options. So uh, there are two distinctly different kinds of, of, uh, of exchanges, and I think it's interesting to kind of see that. If we think about individual companies, we can think about, in this case, they're looking at Twitter, and this is March 27th of 2020. If you notice, the price here is $24.98. This comes from Yahoo Finance. And of course, there's lots of information that you can find about a company. And besides this little snapshot here, there are other things. You can get company outlook. Now, you'll notice it has a little uh, uh, lock there. Uh, Yahoo has uh, figured out a way to monetize their website. So some of the information that you get, you can only get if you sign up for a premium account. Um, I have not done that. Uh, so some of the information that's out there is just not available to me through Yahoo Finance. But you can look at charts, different statistics. You can get historical prices and data. You can get financial statements. Lots of things you can get from uh, Yahoo Finance. So this is just a picture, if you will, of uh, a company. And how you get that is you'll notice that there's a little box here that says, quote, look up. If you type in there the, the, the ticker symbol, you will find a company that, um, or it will go to a company's website and you'll see the price, et cetera. So let's talk about this price. We've talked about equilibrium, et cetera. Let's talk about a concept called market efficiency. Securities are normally in equilibrium and they are fairly priced. So what does that mean? It means that investors cannot beat the market except through good luck or better information. So that is what we refer to as market efficiency. And there is a, a, a whole uh, series of chapters that we could talk about with how we test market efficiency. Is it 
very efficient, not so efficient, whatever. But if you look in general at companies, right, small companies are not followed much by investors, like big investors. So they don't have a lot of contact with investors. So the, the, the chance that their price that you see is fairly priced, there's some questions whether or not it is fairly priced or not. Now, large companies are followed by lots of people. They have good communication with investors. So their pricing mechanism, their prices that you see are more likely to be fairly priced. And the, uh, we'll maybe talk about this in some later videos, but uh, for right now, that's really what we need to understand about stock market efficiency. So let's look at an example, right? So you hear in the news, a medical research company just got FDA approval for one of its products. If the market is highly efficient, can you take advantage of this information? And the answer is, if the market is efficient, that information is already in the price. So it's probably too late for you to capitalize on the information. Now that doesn't mean you can't make money in that stock, but based on that information today, it's very unlikely that you'll be able to get a high rate of return, better than what the stock market would earn on that kind of investment. A small investment's been reading about a hot IPO. So she wants to invest in it. She wants to buy a lot of stocks. Would you advise her to do this? And the answer is, since it is an IPO, that means there's very little information. So what do we know about the price of this thing and the reality of the business's value? And the answer is we probably might not want to invest in it because we just don't have enough information, right? Small investors, right? That is a very high risk for small investors. One other thing that we need to talk about is there are many different branches of finance, right? We could talk about real estate finance, investments, corporate finance, right? There's lots of different areas. But overall, when you think about making decisions, decisions are consistent across the board. Now, lately, when I say lately, I'm talking about the last maybe 10, 15 years, there has been some new thought about how people make decisions. And it's what's referred to as behavioral finance. And what this does is it creates some problems with efficiency because investors may not be using in information properly or they're not using information at all. So it's very costly and risky for traders to take advantage of mispriced assets. Why? Because you don't know if they're mispriced or not, if you don't have the information or if you're not using it. So there are what they refer to here as cognitive biases, right? There are things in our psyches that make us do things that lead us to inefficient um, outcomes. So when we talk about behavioral finance, it really is just the combination of psychology and decision-making, right? When you bring those two things together, we try to understand why do people invest in the things they invest in, right? So hopefully we can talk about how we evaluate risks differently, right? And people look at risks differently when markets are good compared to when they're bad. And uh, really they probably shouldn't, right? Uh, they become anchored in certain kinds of viewpoints, right? Once you decide something, right? It's very difficult to get a person to change their thoughts, right? So even if it's you make a decision and it's wrong, it's difficult for you to admit that you're wrong and then make a change. 
So behavioral finance has an influence on primarily the investor, but it also flows into the way managers make decisions in the company. Thanks a lot for uh, listening to the video. I look to talk to you soon.